My name is Eddie Jackson Jr. and this is Real True Street Crime. <clears throat> I was sitting here reminiscing with Courtney thinking about a conversation we had the other day and he was telling me about how him and my father went to Las Vegas and the things they used to do and how it was like another life ago. It's been so long. And what we always had to laugh and joke with one another and say is you have to be on to ever fall off. If you ain't never been on, you can't possibly fall off. So we laughed and we joked and we thought about that and he was telling me about how when they went out to Las Vegas and the fat man would go out there, Caesar's Palace was his favorite casino, he'd go to Caesar's Palace. When he checked in, they give him the whole flow for the crew. He get a master suite. He get the whole flow. Could nobody come on that flow but his crew? They'd had the entire flow and he'd had a master suite. And all that was done. Las Vegas do that for anybody who's gonna lose a million dollars or more. You can get that treatment. All you got to do is be willing to lose a million dollars or more or perhaps win a million and they'll give you that room to keep you in the casino. But anyway, as we was talking about, and we was going through the kind of money we made, you know, that's what really was astounding and both of us had to just laugh and joke to ourselves. He was a part of a hundred million dollar run, thanks to Jimmy Hoffman. And for any man, a black man in the 70s, coming from Black Bottom, Hastings Street, to actually make it and see millions of dollars, go places you never thought you'd go, do things you thought you'd never do, and it's a wonderful life, and most people may not never get to experience it. I've played with my first million dollars when I was 16 years old. We were smuggling out of Thailand with Marion Wakefield and Richard Wakefield, and that's where I played with my first million. Out of that clique, we made $5 million in 18 months is what we made. And the government will document it for you and tell you. You understand? We fixed all our properties up, new roofs, painted, new carpet. We redid every apartment building we had. We had Oakman, Geneva. We had Hancock. We had Benson the house. We had a couple more houses on blocks. But we redid all of that with the $5 million along with having a good time. So in 18 months, we went through $5 million. And after that, the feds closed us down, indicted my father, gave him 60, 60 years for a nonviolent crime, which is a miscarriage of justice at any time. And I just look at now how society is going and how justice is just, there is no justice and it should be no peace. Behind George Floyd killing and all these things, a president denying that the most panduric epidemic of our lifetime does not exist and we right in the middle of it. And as people, we accept that. It's a shame. I think back to my father, Milton Henry and Malcolm X. They was always pushing the envelope and pushing, trying to push black people further. It's very few, and that was something Courtney really keyed on the other day we was talking. He said, Eddie, very few black men in their lifetime have ever sold drugs, ever could make a difference, ever have had the honor of Huey P. Newton, giving money away to him, not selling to the Black Panthers, giving to them from money to narcotics, whatever they needed. We was there to exist. We was a part of it. Black men today now wouldn't give anybody anything. They are the most stingiest race of people, and maybe it's because they ain't getting no money, or maybe it's because they got dark hearts. Me and Courtney talked about that. You couldn't work for my father and your house wasn't paid for and your Cadillac wasn't paid for. 
Everybody in Eddie Jackson's crew had a house paid for and had a Cadillac, if not one, two paid for. My father was not the type of man who wanted to make all of the money, take all of the fat out of the package, and leave none for the crew. I want the crew to tell you all how the fat man left the fat in there for them to be men of money and wealth. Courtney said it best. Eddie Jackson never wanted to be the only black man with money. When Eddie Jackson bought one house in Southfield, he loved and revered Courtney so much, he bought him one right next door to him, whether he could afford or not. And Courtney will tell you that story for himself. That man was not selfish. I can't ever tell y'all I seen a selfish bone in the man body when he was doing 60 years. He was steady looking out for people, like putting Demetrius on to be a well. The average person sitting in jail wouldn't do nothing for nobody. And that's just the truth. There's too much jealousy among us as black people. We do not want to see each other with money. We want to be the only nigga riding the Rolls Royce or the only nigga living out in Warbeak or wherever it may be you want to. Eddie Jackson walked up to Courtney Brown when he moved to Southfield and told Courtney Brown, I need some company out here. He didn't want to be the only nigga out there. He wanted more black people to be out there. And he ensured that and told Courtney, you go get the house next door to me. Courtney said to him, I ain't got no money to let that. Don't you worry about that, Bull. I got you. And Bull hadn't sold no dope or nothing else at that point. He did it out of love, and that's the motherfucker he had known his entire life, and that was when all Lodge was dead. Bull was it. Lodge, Bull, and the fat man. So he showed Bull incredible love. And Bull will tell you that, which is Courtney Brown. He will sit there and tell you, I have never, and I'm 93 years old, met another man on this earth like your father, and I have met plenty men. And Courtney Brown going to tell you that. Because to fuck with him was a once in a lifetime thrill. If you got a chance to fuck with him, it's the time of your life, and it's very few people you will hear say anything that was a part of Eddie Jackson's crew, but I wish we could do it again. And that's the honest to God truth. It hurts me to see how stingy niggas is. Sell you a hundred dollar gram, you can't put shit on it, so now you work it for this motherfucker, buying a hundred dollars a gram a day, if you sell it as it is, you make 200 So he know you ain't going to never blow up and be what he is. You ain't going to never be able to move in the neighborhood he live in. He already know that. Because he's securing as the black man giving you the bag. I want this nigga to work for me. He thinks he worked for himself, but he actually works for me. And he's paying me to work for me. He give me $100 for a gram. He can't put shit on it. He flip it and make $200. Where the fuck you think he running right back to? Me. If you that type of motherfucker who fuck over your people and take all the fat out of a package. As I said to you in my father's day, a gram we did not sell. You had to at least come in at an eight ball, three and a half grams. You had to at least get a half a quarter. You understand? And at that point, you might have paid... Let me see, it was $8,500 an ounce, $4,200 for a half ounce. Uh, half of that is seven grams, which was about $1,400. An eight ball would have cost you about $700 when the fat man was getting down. But out of three and a half grams, you paid $700 for, I guarantee you, you could at least motherfucking make three or four times that off of it. So if you spent $700, I guarantee you, you was going to come out that package with no less than $3,500, close to $4,000. This is the kind of action the fat man used to lead. 
as I said, when he gave Pep 50 quarters for 50000 he already knew Pep was going to make $100,000 off the package. But what he also knew was Pep had a crew that he had to pay. If one of them go to jail and he's a real one, he got to get them out, get a lawyer to help them out. So that's why he left him so much room in the package. So if he runs into trouble, he got money to deal with the trouble. But these niggas don't leave you no money like that. So when you run into trouble, the only out they leave you is to get the snitching on them and telling. Because they ain't made no motherfucking money. And you think a nigga gonna do 20 years for you. You riding around in the Rolls Royce. He riding around in a goddamn Chrysler. And you think he finna lay down for you for 20 years. Yeah, kid yourself if you want to. The fat man always knew that. That's why he made goddamn show. A nigga made more money than he ever was. And if he told on me, he was really the rottenest motherfucker on this earth. Because I made goddamn show everybody made money. And everybody in the crew was taken care of. You ain't never heard a story of a motherfucker tell you Eddie Jackson left me hanging. Because it wasn't a story to be told like that. Because he was a real one. There's so many fake ass niggas out here now it ain't even funny. Most niggas you see as fake as they goddamn come. They wouldn't know a real one if he hit them in the goddamn head. That's how fake these niggas is. And my father used to talk about Right around when Demetrius and we was getting down and it was going down, he said, hey, baby, you know something? These niggas in Detroit that fucked Detroit's name up so bad, all Detroit is known for in big circles is running off with a motherfucker's money, man. He said, nigga, give a nigga 100 keys. Now he got to sit a kill squad down to get this nigga because he refused to pay him. So niggas stop fronting niggas in Detroit because they wouldn't pay their bill and they wouldn't act like real men. That's why we was always able to get the package because a motherfucker always got paid unless the police took it. And a motherfucker knew that seriously like when they busted the house out there with 88 keys in it. It's all over the news. A motherfucker ain't got the question if the dope got took, if I ran out. You see the goddamn shit on the news, all 88 keys of it. But these niggas, you got to send motherfuckers from everywhere looking for this motherfucker killer over something you fronted him over your money. This is why these niggas in Detroit ain't getting it like that. They ain't riding no goddamn Rolls Royces and goddamn Lamborghinis like niggas is in Florida like water. A common car you see there, a Lamborghini, Rolls Royce, Bentley, Bentley truck, Rolls Royce station wagon. You see them every day riding around the street and you see black people like me driving them. Because them niggas down there getting them big bags and they paying for them. They ain't got a problem with when all them goddamn keys come in in Florida, a motherfucker saying I ain't gonna give you none. They giving them to them niggas and them niggas is clowning with them. And it's good to see them young brothers get that money and ride them roses and be that motherfucking star. Live your life like that. Because you're going to get older one day and you're going to be like me and you're going to want to reflect back on, I did all that shit and it ain't fake because the government will tell you that. Ryan Gear Valley. On Crime Town. On Spotify. I ask everybody who listens to me. Listen to Crime Town, King Pins Kids. That is the story on Spotify with Ryan Gill Valley, the officer that busted my father and them. And if you listen to this, it would be an excellent story to listen to. It's a podcast on Spotify called Crime Town, and our episode is King Pins Kids. And these are the memories I be bringing y'all from a kingpin. And me and Courtney always said that as a kingpin kid, I've seen things that I even have a problem with believing I've seen now. I've seen a room full of money, the goddamn money full to the ceiling in a room like this, not no goddamn halfway full. We talk about full to the goddamn ceiling all the way around, barely got enough room to walk in this motherfucker. 
and you sit back on days nine and just say to yourself, wow, I was a part of that shit, man. We sure enough made some motherfucking noise, man. We wasn't bullshitting when we was out here. We was really playing with them M's. And as I say to all of y'all right now, the house I grew up in in Southfield, 17533 West Hampton, right here today, it's worth $2 million. That's what we came up in in the 70s. You understand? So it was a wonderful life, a wonderful home, growing up in Southfield and all my memories and experiences from there, some good, some bad. But this is Eddie Jackson, Real True Street Crime, coming back at you saying, thank you to all my subscribers. Stay safe out there. Please wear your mask. Please don't listen to Benedict Arnold, Donald J. Trump. You heard it here first. Bennett O'Rourke said it last night. The Republican Party is a death party trying to kill as many American people as they can. Every state you see shit out of control, except for California, is in the South and Republican governors. They are not good people to rule. The only thing Republicans can do is cut taxes. And that's not going to get us out of this corona situation. Cutting taxes is not going to help us now. We need Dr. Fauci and his experts and his opinions and advice how to get out of this corona mess. Donald Trump and the Republican Party has thrown America in two. So I've always said it to you all and I'm saying it to you now. You do not have a stomach for politics, but I ask you all, please get out and vote on this one and make Joe Biden the candidate and let's get out of this corona mess. This is Eddie Jackson Jr. saying thank you to all my subscribers. This is real true street crime and I kick the stories back coming. My voice has gotten a little better now. So I get back on my horse and get back to telling my stories. I hope y'all miss me because I missed all of y'all. Thank you very much to all my subscribers and I appreciate y'all all. Peace and love. I'm out.